Hey, Shalawan, Mashahab to all. Kuri Mayo here once again. Just want to briefly mention something before I continue talking about uh, the enslavement of the indigenous American Aboriginal. And in regards to who actually came over here, who were these explorers, who were these conquistadors, who were these uh, settlers, Europe was not all about white people. If you still think Europe was all white, then you don't know what you're talking about. If you think that all Spaniards and all Portuguese were white, then you don't know what you're talking about. If you didn't know there was black conquistadors, black Jews, aka Moranos, black Moors, slash Europeans who helped in the invasion and the finance of the conquest and in the enslavement of your ancestors and who most likely are living amongst us today their descendants talk about let's go back to Africa it says here the Moranos the Moorish Jews of Portugal Spain and Benin Guinean Coast Part 1 by Ogwe Giofo Anu it says here Black Moorish Jews of Maghrib, Sudan and Iberian Peninsula the Moranos Black Jews have lived in Iberia and Africa as far back as the time of the Carthaginians. Jewish traders sailed on Carthaginian merchant ships and traded all along the coast of North Africa and even into the many African tribes along the coast of North Africa and way into the southern savannas. Beyond the Sahara deserts, they were ancient Hebraic Jewish tribes. So these were ancient Hebraic Jewish tribes tribes we'll see later who what kind of jewish or hebraic tribes so-called jewish those tribes got caught up in the events that followed the death of the islamic prophet muhammad all the way from medina to maghrib it is widely acknowledged that one of the most determined fighters against the black arab encroachment on black african berber property was queen kahina a black jewess queen of the maghrib Early Arab scholars who visited the southern fringes of the Sahara Desert report the presence of Jewish tribes in places such as ancient Ghana and Mali. Many tribes in Africa today still recall their Hebraic roots, and many more con continue their ancient Jewish laws and tradition, unadulterated by the politics of modern days. When the African Moors moved north and conquered Spain, it was a confederation of African Muslims, African Jews and African Christians who affected the victory. So these Moors, what is telling us here, that invaded Europe and went and held it down for about 600, 700 years, it was a mixture of basically Muslims, Jews, and Christians. All couple of colored or so called Negroes, but they were different kinds of uh, beliefs and tribes and people going up to Europe. It's not like they were all just Muslim, as, as most of us think, but there were also among them Jews. We'll see what kind of Jews these were. The African Jews and the African Muslims were brothers genetically, phenotypically, and historically. They were the same black people pursuing the same goals of righteous existence, right? So there's some relation there, right? They're saying, well, we know that the Muslims and the you know, Hebrews, um, they say that one of their patriarchs is Abraham, so there, there is correlation in that. And, and if we read the Old Testament, right? So, continue says, So the African Moorish Empire took root in Iberia and, and the rest of the southern Mediterranean coast. Black African Muslims and Black African Jews with their Black African Christians as such ruled Europe for the next 700 years. BreakingIsraelNews.com It says here, Was Christopher Columbus a Marano Jew? His Hebrew writing says yes. Right, so according to this article, uh, they are correlating that Christopher Columbus is a Marano Jew. And we'll talk about uh, what Marano is in a moment. 
and it begins, the more historians research Christopher Columbus, the more they question the true origins of the great explorer credited for discovering America. In fact, there is growing speculation that Columbus was a Jew, fleeing the Spanish Inquisition rather than an Italian, hired by King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella to find riches in Asia. There is a lot of evidence that Christopher Columbus was a man of faith seeking to help his brethren escape certain deaths or conversion in Spain, and even that he dreamed of rebuilding the Third Holy Temple in Jerusalem, noted Roni Sigal, academic advisor for the Israel Institute of Biblical Studies, an online language academy to breaking Israel news. For starters, Georgetown University linguist Estelle Isisari has analyzed hundreds of Columbus handwritten letters, diaries, and documents. She found that Columbus' primary language was Castilian Spanish, the Jiddish of the day for Spanish Jews, otherwise known as Ladino. Right? So, Jiddish. They're not talking about Paleo Hebrew, they're talking about Jiddish. So, what they speak today. In Israel is Jiddish as well. Columbus also left money to other explorers with the belief that his successors would eventually liberate the Holy Land. Simon Weisenthal writes in his book Sales of Hope that Columbus' voyage was motivated by a desire to find a safe haven for the Jews suffering from the Spanish Inquisition. E echoing this sentiment, Carol Delaney, a cultural anthropologist at Stanford University, believes that Columbus was a deeply religious man who sought riches in order to finance the return of Jerusalem to the Jewish people and the rebuilding of its holy temple. Right? So you see Columbus, you know, in his ideas and his beliefs, you know, he did write that he was going to America to conquer or reconquer the holy city and Mount Zion. For the king and queen all right he said that all right so continue says perhaps even more telling columbus signed his last will and testament with a triangular signature of dots and letters similar to what is inscribed on gravestones in spanish jewish cemeteries in fact he ordered his heirs to use this this symbol in perpetuity though his story claims that columbus voyage was funded by queen isabella in actuality it appears that jewish conversos those who converted by force to Catholicism, and prominent Jews gave the explorer an interest-free loan. These investors included Luis de Santangel, Gabriel Sanchez, Rabbi Don Isaac Abrabanel, a known Jewish statesman. Indeed, Columbus' initial letters discussing his journey were sent to Santangel and Sanchez, thanking them for their support and telling them what he had found. So who financed Columbus? These Murano Jews. Right, we're going to see who these Muranos are again. We're going to see what kind of Jews these were and why Columbus related so much to the discovery of America to the return of Jerusalem. So I wanted to go back to this painting from the beginning of the article and uh, it's called The Return of Christopher Columbus and it says here his audience before King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella painting by Eugene de la Crux. This is a, a historical painting I looked at. And I just wanted to show you something in case you didn't notice it at first. Uh, well, regarding uh, King Ferdinand. Um, as you can see here, he is basically a copper colored person. Right? Or more, mulatto, whatever they want to call him or tag him as. But he's definitely not the same complexion as those around him as you can see here. That's King Ferdinand. All right, this is the king and queen during the time of Columbus uh, voyages. All right, copper colored. Remember that Europe, black nobility, so-called black. So I'm at the uh, Virtual Jewish World uh, website, and it says here by David Krush or Crush. The small Jewish community in the Bahamas has origins dating to the 17th century. The British first settled the Bahamas in 1620. However, few Jews came to, the, to live on the islands. Luis de Torres, who was the official interpreter for Christopher Columbus, is thought to have been the first Jew 
and European to set foot in the new world. All right, so this Luis de Torres, um, you know, he's copper colored. All right, and uh, as you can see, he's the interpreter, the official interpreter for Christopher Columbus, a Jew, right? So again, he is thought to have been the first Jew and European to set foot in the new world when the Santa Maria landed at San Salvador in 1492. Torres was a Marano, a secret Jew, hmm, secret Jew, who officially practiced Catholicism, but was escaping the dangers of Europe during the Inquisition. He was fluent in Arabic, Hebrew, Chaldean, Spanish, Portuguese, French, and Latin. Right? So he spoke all these languages. But, uh, you know, mainly we're going to see, you know, he brought them because of, especially because he knew Hebrew. All right. And continuing on the same website, it says, Conversos and Maranos. The term Marano and Converso were applied in Spain and Portugal to the descendants of baptized Jews suspected of secret adherence to Judaism. Converso from the Latin conversus meant literally the converted. Various origins for the term Marano have been suggested, which include the Hebrew marit ayin, the appearance of the eye, referring to the fact that the Maranos were ostensibly Christian, but actually Jews. Mohoram ata, you are excommunicated. The Aramaic Hebrew mar anus, forced convert. The Hebrew Mumar, apostate, with the Spanish ending Ano, the Arabic Murain, hypocrite, and the second word of the ecclesiastical imprecation, Anatima Maranata. All such derivations, however, are unlikely. The most probable is from the Spanish word meaning swine or pig, swine or pig derived from the Latin veris, wild boar. The term probably did not originally refer to the Jews' reluctance to eat pork, as some scholars hold. From its earliest use, it was intended to impart the sense of luthen conveyed by the word. Although romanticized and regarded by later Jewry as a badge of honor, the term was not as widely used, especially in official circles as is often believed. In Latin America, as a rule, it is not found in official documents. As a rule, alright, so they removed this word Marano. You hear that? In Latin America. So it says it is not found in official documents. And there is little evidence of its unofficial use in most places. It is not clear if the old Christians only or the secretly practicing Jews also called themselves Maranos. All right, so you see, they took that out of the documents in Latin America. They don't want you to know there was Maranos over here. Encyclopedia.com. Maranos, a term of opprobrium designating Jews and occasionally Muslims, okay? Occasionally Muslims or Moors, right? Converted to Christianity and their descendants was used in the Iberian world in late medieval and early modern times. The Castilian word Marano, deriving from Arabic word for pro prohibited or illicit, means swine or pork, and either expressed the same abhorrence toward converts as the converts had previously felt toward the ritually unclean animal or insinuated suspicions regarding the converts' continued loyalties to Judaism. Usage of the term appears to have been limited to common parlance and st satirical literature, all right? So it says, it's, it's also stating here that it wasn't used, that it was limited, right? The usage of this word, like we read before, it wasn't put into Latin American documents. It says, in modern times, Jewish historians revived the term to underscore the uniqueness of the Marano phenomenon in Iberian and Jewish history. So it was revived or it was brought back. From the book Christopher Columbus and the Participation of the Jews in the Spanish and Portuguese Discoveries by Dr. M. Kayser Ling. This was written in 1894. And we're in chapter uh, 6 here. It says, After the Spanish monarchs had expelled all the Jews from all their kingdoms and lands in January, in that same month they 
commissioned me to undertake the voyage to India with a properly equipped fleet. So Columbus, this is from Columbus's words stating in 1492, how in the same, at the same time that the Jews were being expelled from uh, Spain and Portugal, that he was given the, the order or the permission, the authority and, and the funding for his uh, journey right to India it says right India why India because South America and the Americas right farthest India was called India or where the Indio indigo people are the dark-skinned people indigenous people all right so Tuna says these are the words with, with with which Columbus begins his journal all right the expulsion of the Jews from Spain is closely connected with Columbus expedition and with the discovery of America. All right, so it's very important what happened to the Jews in Spain and to the discovery of America. Okay, not merely externally in point of time, but also intrinsically. On March 31st, 1492, the Catholic monarch sent forth from the palace of the Alhambra the edict that all Jews and Jew Jewesses a very age should on pain of death leave all the kingdoms and lands of Spain within four months. The edict which was signed by Ferdinand and Isabella is of a holy religious character, especially as regards the chief reason given for that act. The reason given is that in spite of the incessant and most energetic efforts of the Inquisition, the Moranos were begilded by those who adhered to Judaism to return to their old faith and that this greatly imperiled the Catholic religion. All right, so they were, you see what's going on. I just wanted you to have a, a reference of what was going on at the same time Columbus was leaving uh, Europe, all right, and coming to America. All right, now with that reference, so let's read about uh, Columbus' first voyage and who he was with. It says here, on August 2nd, the Spanish Jews began their wanderings and the next day, Friday, August 3rd, Columbus with his fleet on three ships, the Santa Maria, the Pinta, and Nina, sailed to seek an ocean route to India, again, India slash America, and to discover a new world, or the real old world, which he knew about. He was accompanied on his first voyage by not more than 120 men, so 120 uh, people went with Columbus on his first voyage according to some writers by only 90 according to other writers almost all Castilians and Aragonese many of them were from Palos and some from Guadalajara Avila, Segovia, Caceres, Castrojeris, Ledesma, Villar and Talavera all cities in which before the expulsion large of small Jewish communities existed all right so you hear all these people that are going to Columbus most of them are basically Moranos all right being expelled continuing were there any persons of Jewish extraction on the Armada which under Columbus guidance steered its course towards a new world it was not easy for him to find men willing to accompany him on his adventurous voyage even persons guilty of crime were released from prison on condition that they should enroll themselves among the recruits all right so the kings and queens they made a law because nobody wanted to go with Columbus nobody wanted to do the trip so they sent criminals they let them go from, you know, their prisons over there. So they sent criminals over with Columbus, right? Criminals, right? That's who they sent to you to come over here and invade you and make you turn into uh, Christianity. And they're prisoners. They're, they're criminals, all right? What was to prevent Jews under the ban of expulsion, persecuted and homeless from taking part in the voyage? Among the explorers, companions whose names have come down to us, the complete list is lost, according to them, right? They don't want us to know who was there. There were several men of Jewish stock. For example, Luis de Torres. Again, here we go. Luis de Torres, right? Remember, he was the interpreter. It says, a Jew who had occupied a position under the governor of Murcia and who was baptized shortly before Columbus sailed. As he understood Hebrew, Chaldee and some Arabic Columbus employed him as interpreter again another source as interpreter so they knew they were going to the old world so he brought this person Luis de Torres just in case because he knew many languages but especially Hebrew because 
we'll see later that Columbus was looking for the Grand Khan or the Prester John, right? And uh, continuing a little ahead of, in this book, it says, uh, and before that said, a body of men, Spaniards, Moors, and Jews, as well as Irishmen and Genoese, had covered more than 2,000 miles. The seamen began to murmur loudly at the intolerable length of the voyage. So it's stating here, you know, who was with uh, Columbus against Spaniards, Jews, and Moors traveling with Columbus over to enslave you to recover the Holy Land in Mount Zion, as Christopher Columbus stated in the Book of Prophecies he wrote, which is in the Columbina Library in Seville. All right, so it continues, says, Columbus calmed them as well as he could. On October 11th, after the customary evening hymn, he admonished his crew to keep a sharp lookout for land. In addition to the gratuity of 10,000 maravedis offered by the king, he promised a silk waistcoat to him who should first sight land. At last, early on Friday morning, October 12th, mm, D-Day, huh? the day on which the Jews expelled from Spain and their co-religionists in every part of the world were singing their hosannas, the cry, tierra, tierra, land, land, arose from the Pinta. This is from the book, The Secret Archives of the Vatican by Maria Luisa Ambrosini. You can get this in Barnes and Noble. All right, and this was a hard book to get. I had to take a screenshot of every page. It was only on loan. And so it says here, greater than Europe and Africa. The popes had been collecting Hebrew codices since Avignon, Avignon times. And while the count of a voyage a quarter of the way around the world is an odd thing to find in the records of a desert people, there is. So they're saying that, they, that the Vatican and these popes had uh, documents and codices going back, you know, Hebrew codices stating that they, how they traveled the world, right? How they had lands far away. Right? It says, and they called them desert people, but we know they weren't all desert people. There is, when one comes to think of it, a surprising frequency of reference to the sea and its islands in biblical writings. A reflection of desert man's longing for water, or an unacknowledged heritage from the Phoenicians. The document, if it existed, has disappeared, according to them, right? It may be in one of the bundles of unclassified documents in the miscellanea, and it probably definitely is. It may have been destroyed in the sack of Rome in the next century, or the cosmographer friend may simply have given it to Pinzon, who ha would have had no trouble getting it retranslated in Spain, from which Jews had not yet been evicted. The fact that Columbus took with him on his first voyage an interpreter, again, who was converted Jew and skilled in Hebrew, though he knew only a little Arabic, suggests that he may have attached importance to the legend. All right, so even the Vatican and these people studying these records in the Vatican let you know that Columbus brought this Hebrew interpreter for a reason. He believed in something. All right, just like he wrote that he was going to go recover the holy city and Mount Zion, right? A fragment of supporting evidence comes from Paleobotany. The same variety of cotton was being cultivated both in Peru and in the Indus Valley in 2500 BC. Alright, so here we go again. Peru, right? Peru. So they're saying that we had cotton, right? We were making cotton, growing it, making clothing, right? In Peru, in the same time as the Indus Valley. You know, this is the true old world we've seen before that the all these pyramids are over here the mummies you know this is Atlantis so we can see that you know they're always trying to match something old that happened over here to something on the other side of the world all right but we we know this is the true old world right so let's continue it says since since cotton seed is killed by seawater this may be an indication of intercontinental contact somewhere back in the megalithic age that seems less and less primitive the more we learn about it the great names of the past crowded around the discovery of America. So it says again, the great names of the past crowded around the discovery of America, as ancient writings newly printed were searched for evidence and opinion. Columbus studied P 
Ptolemy, Aristotle, and Pliny. So you see Columbus studying these people because these people are the ones with the legends, right, of Atlantis, like Plato and, and all these other people. So these same people study the uh, Plato because in other accounts, Columbus is said to be actually a Greek and his name is different than Christopher Columbus if he is a real person. Right? We're going to get to that. But as you can see, there's a lot of Greek influence here. And the Greeks are the ones who wrote about Atlantis, right? Or America. He had a copy of Pope Aeneas Silvius' Historia Rerum Ubique Gestarum. The Pope had mo modestly planned the universal history and geography and had completed the section on Asia. He read e Esdras, the prophet of the Apocrypha and was inclined to believe him because St. Ambrose and St. Augustine had thought highly of him. Also, Edras told Columbus what he wanted to hear. His estimate of the Earth's relative proportion of land and water made it seem that the Atlantic would be conveniently narrow. So you see how they're talking about Esdras, right? And we also know that in the book of Esdras is when they talk about the Assyrian captivity and how the, the lost tribes, right, decided to um flee into the wilderness right they separated right so continuing even prince henry the navigator in his research institute of sagris found some of his inspiration and motivation in legend all right so all these legends they had in europe and west africa is really stories of old of atlantis or slash america or the old india or the third ethiopia right the route around Africa was to lead not only to the prosperity of Oriental trade, but to the kingdom of Prester John. Again, Prester John, a.k.a. King David, a.k.a. the Grand Khan or Wan Khan, into the gardens of the high point of the world. It is strange that the Queen of Sheba should have come down to us as a sex goddess for what the biblical writers thought worth mentioning about her was her intellectuality. They tell us that when she came to Jerusalem, are we talking about Peru, right? Ancient Jerusalem, to the city where Solomon had made silver to be as stones and the cedars like sycamores, the cedars, in the veil for abundance. It was to prove him with hard questions. Another legend or the rumor of a legend repeats the theme of quest questioning intelligence and forms a tenuous but fascinating tie between the library archives of the church and the discovery of America. So you hear these legends of uh, Solomon and Sheba and Sheba uh, questioning his intelligence or seeing how wise he was, you know, basically coincides and correlates with the discovery of America, right? It's no separation. Again, Columbus said he went to recover the holy city in Mount Sion. That's Cusco, Peru over there. The ancient Jerusalem, the city of David is Sexawaman, which is the fortress or the citadel that's still standing with three walls as Jerusalem is described by Josephus, aka Pisa. Let's continue. One of Columbus officers, the able but rebellious Martin Alonso Pinzon, captain of the Pinta, who had helped fit out the ships and recruit seamen for the enterprise, later felt that his services had been inadequately recognized and rewarded. In 1515, nine years after Columbus' death, an inquest was held as part of the Pinzon's suit against the Columbus family. In the course of it, Pinzon's son swore that on a visit he and his father had made to Rome, his father had called on a friend who was a cosmographer at the Vatican Library. This friend had lent him a Hebrew document, Hebrew document from the Papal Library, which said that in Solomon's time it was believed that the Queen of Sheba had sailed out of the Mediterranean into the Atlantic and there, 95 degrees to the westward by an easy passage. She had found a land called Sipanso, which Pinzon took to be Japan. So Sipanso, yeah, and we're going to hear about Sipango. And that's what Columbus was looking for when he actually went to America. That is basically what he thought was over there, which was in, he thought was in America, right? The, or the India, the farthest India, the Bango, the Orient. Fertile and abundant, 
whose extent surpassed Africa and Europe. So you hear that, very fertile and abundant, whose extent surpassed Africa and Europe, and that's definitely America. The Pinzons claimed that they themselves had intended to make this voyage, and that Columbus, despondent at the king's failure to finance his project, had taken heart after learning of this document. Witnesses were found to confirm the testimony. So Columbus wasn't even going to do it until Pinzon was about to go do it. All right? So he stole his idea. That's what they're saying here. If Columbus was real. The story is not intrinsically impossible. All right? So that's where we're in this book. Let's just go to somewhere else. So basically, you see that they knew that America was over there. We saw in the other videos, right? How the uh, Vatican talks about these distant lands they were going to go conquer. Right? The dumb diverses, Papa Bull. They knew existed these distant, mysterious lands. All right, so you see here that they were knew that Solomon's lands or the promised lands, right, or the holy land or the middle of the earth, the center, the navel, existed. And they knew it was if they continued westward from Europe, well, where they would end up. And it was right there. That's where Columbus and, and all these people were going. Columbus, of course, didn't find the Indies or Prester John. All right, that's, that's, that's how they view it. Though when he came upon what would later be called Hispaniola, modern-day Haiti and Dominican Republic, he was convinced he had reached the east. So he still thought he was in the east. So they just said he didn't reach it, but he did. You no, know, he 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 knew where he was going, and he he like I reached it. This is the far east because in ancient maps, America, and like in Roman or Greek maps, is shown to be on the side of China or all the way down uh, to the east. You can see that in the Macrobius map of 440. All right, so you can see the Caribbean and Florida sticking out on that on that map. So, anyways, so it says he he believed he was convinced that he reached the east, perhaps somewhere near the fabled riches of Kublai Khan. All right, Kublai Khan. So he he, he was like, I, I reached the, the Khan, the Grand Khan, and bring it with him same apocalyptic crusading ideology that had in the part driven the age of explorations he set about conquering these lands and enslaving its inhabitants in service to the crown and christendom so who got enslaved the native americans they came to conquer the lands right the papal bull gave authority and permission to take your kingdoms your dukedoms your principalities your lands your people and put them in perpetual slavery and columbus is confirming that and that's what he knew he had to go do all right so because in his mind it was the end of the world it says here these were after all the end times these people thought it was the end of the world so, because they had found the lost tribes you know it's a legend they believed in so he thought it was the end of the world it says every bit of land had to be made ready for christ's imminent return it says there and as faithful Christians, they also had the right, even duty, to exploit in its pagan inhabitants for every scrap of resource. Again, the dumb diverses, the Papal Bull, issued in 1452, calls you pagan. Now, anybody who does not believe in Christ is a pagan. You know, enemies of Christ, so you get enslaved. Perpetual slavery. Right? They had a mission, they had a purpose. Columbus was never lost. That's what I'm trying to get across to you. He came with certain people for a certain reason. All right, so let's continue. And from the book, A History of the Maranos by Cecil Roth. The Maranos in the New World. It says, with this significant passage, Christopher Columbus began his account of the expedition which led to the discovery of the New World. He might have added had he thought it worthwhile that he actually set sail within a day or two of the departure of the last of the Jewish exiles, and that the vessels which conveyed them were lying in the roadstead of Seville in close proximity to his own little squadron. The connection between the Jews and the discovery of America was not, however, merely a question of fortuitous coincidence. That epic making expedition of 1492 was a matter of fact very largely a Jewish or rather Marano enterprise. Marano. Mar. There are grounds for believing that Columbus was himself a member of a new Christian family. It is indeed highly ironical that the patriotic attempts made today to claim him as a Spaniard are mostly based upon the assumption that he was a 
furtive member of the race which Spain was even then chasing from her shores. Less hypothetical is the case of others who participated in the great expedition. It was made possible by a loan which Luis Santangel, Chancellor and Con Comptroller of the Royal Household, a great grandson of Noah Chinillo, advanced, though not out of his own purse, to his royal master and mistress. He was a matter of fact the first person to listen to Columbus dreams seriously, and it is highly doubtful whether the Queen would have displayed any interest but for his intervention. So they're saying that this guy, Luis de Santa Del, had a very important role in making sure Columbus made it to the uh, America, right? He, and he's, this was a Murano, he financed it, all right? And uh, hooked him up with the Queen. Gabriel Sanchez, the high treasurer of Aragon, who was another of the explorer's most fervent patrons, was a full Jewish blood. Being a son of a converso couple and a nephew of Al-Azhar Usuf of Saragossa, right? So even Muslim have been there. So see, you know, we got to understand, you know, what Jew are they talking about? Are they talking about ancient Hebrews or are they talking about the Judaism that was coming out of that side of the world? which they practice today by the rabbis and all these uh, Orthodox Jews, right? Uh, Judaism and Hebrew, it's it's kind of different. It's, it is very different, right? So we got to try to understand that part of it, which we will. It was to these two that Columbus addressed the famous letter first announcing the news of his discovery. Among Columbus' other patrons was Alonso de la Caballeria, member of a famous Marano family. Vice Chancellor of Aragon, the only one of the high officials intimately concerned with the genesis of the expedition belonging to an old Christian house, was the royal secretary, Juan de Coloma, whose wife was, however, descended from the Jewish clan of de Iscaballeria. The personnel of the expedition was very similar in composition. There was Alonso de la Calle, whose very name denoted that he was born in the Jewish quarter. Rodrigo Sanchez, a relative of a high treasurer, joined the party as superintendent at the personal request of the queen. Juan Marco was the chief surgeon. Mestre Bernal, who had been re reconciled in 1490 for Judaizing, Judaizing, served as a physician. And Luis de Torres, who accompanied the expedition as interpreter, was baptized just before sail sailing. The latter was, as a matter of fact, the first European to set foot in the new land. So, you know, they're saying in different sources that Luis de Torres was actually the first guy who put his foot over there in the island, wherever island they landed on, which had been first sighted by the Marano sailor Rodrigo de Triana, and another Marano which sighted it, not Columbus, and is worth recording also as the first to make use of tobacco. Recent research necessitates a modification of this statement. Only Torres was assuredly a Jewish origin. Those who had favored the enterprise naturally re reaped some of the rewards. All right, so they're saying that these people got rewarded for going there to America. The first royal grant to export grain and horses to America was made in favor of Luis de Santangel. Remember him, the guy who found, funded the, the whole voyage who may thus be reckoned the founder of the two great American industries. Okay, The Moranos possibly, in part, in order to escape the attentions of the Inquisition, were quick to realize the possibilities of the New World and to transfer themselves thither as colonists. Thus, Luis de Torres, the interpreter to the expedition, received large grants of land in Cuba. He got land in Cuba where he died. Many others of his race followed him, of his race followed him. They, they're talking about other, you know, these are so-called Negroes too, right? So let's, let's remember that, I'm talking about. Attempts were repeatedly made in after years to prevent new Christians and those penanced by the Inquisition as also their descendants from emigrating to the Indies. This was at the best difficult to enforce. While suspension was occasionally secured for financial considerations, thus in 1509, in the composition arrived that in Seville between the conversos and the crown, it was specifically stipulated that in return for a payment of 20,000 ducats, the former were at liberty to go to the colonies 
for the purpose of trade for periods not exceeding two years. In 1518, Charles V, with characteristic zeal for the faith, ordered the royal officers at Seville to prevent them from embarking. After a prolonged struggle, they gained their, their point and were again allowed to leave freely. Among the conquistadores who accompanied Cortes to the conquest of Mexico, there was at least one Marrano, Hernando Alonso. So another Marrano that went with another conquistador, and this famous one, Cortes, right, that went and conquered Mexico. A smith by trade of whom he was a picturesque glimpse hammering nails into the brigantines which served to recapture the city of Mexico, taking a personal share in the assault and subsequently swaggering about it in a belt of refined gold which he had exacted, exacted from the natives. So this Hernando Alonso, right, this Morano, so-called uh, Morano, right, aka this, uh, a black European, as they call him, basically helped and the assault, right, in the city of Mexico, the Teotihuacan, they talk about Moctezuma's empire, and subsequently swaggering about it. So he swagged about it. He he was showing off a gold belt he took from the natives. So you see what they were doing to your ancestors, right? Another uh, more on more crime, right? Black on black crime. So continuing with the subject, uh, not only did Columbus have, you know. Uh, Negro uh, Moors or Jews or Moranos as they want to call them, but he also had uh, with him black conquistadors. All right, in this case, we're in encyclopedia.com here, and this is in regards to Pedro Alonso Niño. It says Pedro Alonso Niño was a Spanish explorer known as El Negro, a native of Megur, Spain. Niño acted as a pilot of the Santa Maria during the first voyage of Christopher Columbus. So he was the navigator of the Santa Maria, as you just heard right there. Now it says in 1499, Nino and Christopher Guerra received permission from Bishop Juan Rodriguez de Fonseca to explore the Gulf of Paraya. On the island of Margarita, they bartered for a considerable quantity of pearls and then made their way to the Cubagua Islands, which they believed to be part of Tierra Firme. There they traded for a substantial amount of pearls and returned to Spain in April 1500, only to be imprisoned for allegedly concealing part of the wealth they had acquired in the New World. Nino was ex exonerated of all charges, was set free, and gained fame for participating in one of the most lucrative voyages to the New World. Continuing with Pedro Alonso Nino, it says Nino was a Moor, born in Palos de Moguer, Spain. Again, a Moor. Of the more coming with Columbus, right? To invade you. He explored the coast of Africa in his early years. He piloted one of Columbus' ships in the expedition of 1492 and accompanied him during his third voyage that saw the discovery of Trinidad in the mouth of the Orinoco River. After returning to Spain, Nino made preparations to explore the Indies independently, looking for gold and pearls, looking for your gold and your pearls. Empowered by the Council of Castile to seek out new countries, avoiding those already found by Columbus, he committed to give 20% of the, his profits for the Spanish crown. In the company of brothers Luis and Cristobal de la Guerra, so he had other brothers who were black conquistadors as well, respectively a rich merchant and a pilot, he left San Lucas in May 1499, and after 23 days they arrived at Maracapana, visiting the islands of Margarita, Coche, and Cubagua. They exchanged objects a little value for a large quantity of pearls before sailing up the coast to Punta Araya, where they discovered salt mines. After two months, they were back in Bayona, Spain, loaded with wealth. However, they were accused of cheating King Ferdinand II out of his portion of the spoils, arrested and with his property confiscated. Nino died before the conclusion of his trial, so they, he did all the dirty work for them and then and they took all his, uh, you know, wealth and property and threw him in jail. So, you know, karma's a bitch. And again, we got Pedro Alonso Nino, a navigator and explorer of African ancestry. It says African. We got to dodge the hijack because he was born in Spain. So he could have been uh, there in generations and generations. Pedro Alonso Nino traveled with Christopher Columbus, first expedition to the New World in 1492. He was also known as El Negro, the Black, 
Pedro Nino was the pilot of the Columbus ship, the Santa Maria. In 1493, he also accompanied Columbus on the explorer's second voyage, which discovered Trinidad in the mouth of the Orinoco River in South America, piloting one of the 17 ships in the fleet. This voyage also brought the first Africans, who were actually free men. Pedro Nino led his own expedition, financed by the Council of Castile, to find gold and pearls in areas not already discovered by Columbus. He returned to Spain very wealthy, but did not live to an agreement he had with the king to turn over 20% of his treasure, known as the Royal Fifth. He was arrested and died in prison before his trial. So we met Pedro Alonso Nino, and now I want to talk about Juan Garrido. So it says here, Juan Garrido was a conquistador who was born in the kingdom of Congo, Miwisi Congo or Congolese by birth, not to be confused with Congolese from the Democratic Republic of Congo, DRC, or the Republic of Congo, aka Congo Brazzaville. These two countries were created after the Berlin Conference of 1884-1885. See, those countries didn't exist before that. He went to Portugal as a young man, says there. In converting to Catholicism, he chose the Spanish name Juan Garrido, Handsome John. He joined Spanish expedition and arrived in Santo Domingo, Hispaniola, about 1502. He participated in the invasion of present-day Puerto Rico and Cuba in 1508. So he also participated, this black African conquistador, right? participated in 1502 in the invasion of Puerto Rico and Cuba, right? right. The, the Aborigines there. Who was these Aborigines? Your ancestors. So he, this guy participated in the invasion. It says by 1519 he had joined Cortes forces and invaded present-day Mexico, participated in the siege of Tenochtitlan. So we heard earlier the other guy who, who was a Marano who also accompanied uh, Cortes to, to invade the city of Mexico. We all, Now we see that Juan Garrido, this black conquistador from West Africa, also helped invade Te, Tenochtitlan. He married and settled in Mexico City, says here. He continued to serve with Spanish forces more than 30 years, including expeditions to Western Mexico and to the Pacific. So he was invading and conquering and enslaving the Aborigines for 30 years years with the Spanish uh, explorers and in this book called Black Conquistadors Armed Africans in Early Spanish America it says I Juan Garrido black resident the color negro vecino of this city Mexico appear before your mercy and state that I am in need of making a provanza to the perpetuity of the king a perpetual ray a report on how I served your majesty in the conquest and pacification of the new Spain from the time when the Marquis del Valle Cortes entered it. So he's talking about how he helped in the conquest of Mexico, right? And in his company, I was present at all the invasions and conquests and pacifications which were carried out always with the said Marquis. So he was always with Cortes and all the invasions again. He was there all of which i did at my own expense without being given either salary or allotment of natives Rep repartimiento de indios so he's saying he did it all by himself without getting any salary or being able to take any native slaves as, as he's saying or anything else as i'm married and a resident of the city where i have always lived and also i went with the marquis del valle to discover the islands which are in that part of the southern sea the pacific where there was much hunger and privation. And also, I went to discover the, and pacify the islands of San Juan de Borinquen, de Puerto Rico. And also, I went on to the pacification and conquest of the island of Cuba with the adelantado Diego Velázquez. In all these ways, for 30 years, I have served and continue to serve your majesty. For these reasons stated above, do I petition your mercy and also because I was the first to have the inspiration to sow maize here in New Spain and to see if it took, I did this and experimented at my own expense. So that was a letter uh, written by Juan Garrido, uh, the black conquistador to the king and queen of uh, Spain for all of his uh, work, which he had done there. He was, I guess, wanted to get paid or recompensed in some way. 
So this is a list I found in this book, uh, same book, which I just mentioned before. Uh, you can see Juan Garrido on the top, it says he's from Africa or Portugal, a black slave it says there. Places of Conquest Activity, Mexico, Zacatula, and Baja California. So he says here the recompense was a manumission, various minor posts, site within Mexico City Trust. So you can see all the rest here and where they went Sebastian Turral, Pedro Fulupo, Juan Bartalis, Antonio Perez, Juan Portugues, Juan Garcia, Miguel Ruiz, Juan Valiente, Juan Beltran, all black conquistadors. You can see some of them were born in Spain, as the Free Mulatto says, but you know, we know that. Europeans were also dark skinned at that time. So it had nothing to do with being slaves or from Africa. At least not at that time, because they was already there for hundreds of years. And just to continue with this book, it says here the sources for this endeavor are a combination of primary material, mostly the genre of colonial chronicles, but including a few archival items and secondary works, some predating Gerhardt's essay but some representing recent work. The article's purpose is to thus first to marshal the widely scattered evidence on the topic with a view to making the broad and simple but hitherto inadequately substantiated if not marginalized point that Africans were an ubiquitous and pivotal part of Spanish conquest campaigns in the Americas. Second, to articulate whatever patterns are visible in black conquest roles and to locate African participation in the phases of Spanish expansion. And third, to argue that such roles should be seen in a longer term colonial context whose most notable features were the existence of black militias and individuals who might have termed black counter conquistadors. From the very onset of Spanish activity in the Americas, Africans were present both as voluntary expeditionaries and as involuntary colonists. So going back to Juan Garrido, the person who wrote that letter to the King and Queen of Spain after his service with them, says, arriving in Santo Domingo in 1502 or 1503, Garrido was among the earliest Africans to reach the Americas, as Columbus was a product of the Italian Portuguese community that played such a crucial role in the slave-based colonization of the Eastern Atlantic in the late 15th century. Black slaves or servants may have traveled with him to the Caribbean in the 1490s. But we already know they did. It's not may have. Right? Although the best evidence for such participants in the assertion in some accounts that Alonso Pietro, Pietro, the pilot of the Nina on the 1492 voyage, was a mulatto. So this Pietro was actually, yes, he was the captain of the Nina. He was a copper colored person, a, a more or dark skinned. Uh, black European, as, as so-called black European, right? And they're calling him here a mulatto. Well, certainly on his fourth voyage in 1502, Columbus traveled with a black cabin boy named Diego, who may have been a servant rather than a slave. That same year, a black slave was sent to trade Spanish goods in Hispaniola, along with other agents of Juan de Córdoba, a conversal merchant who was an associate of Columbus. So we got to be careful when we're reading these accounts and these opinions from the people with because they don't really know if it was a slave or a servant or if they even were any of that because a lot of these, you know, so-called servants were captains of the ship. So how do you put a servant to be the captain of the ship, man? These people had, um, you know, what do you say, a history. They had uh, titles and they had respect. They didn't just like let anybody just be the captain of, of these ships so we gotta dig into who they're saying the servants and dig into the real history of all these characters to see if they were really servants or slaves brought to Europe the earliest evidence of black conquistadors in the Spanish colonies also comes from 1502 in that year the new governor of Hispaniola Nicolas de Ovando brought with him from Spain a number of Iberian born black slaves not only to work, but to help keep the indigenous population subdued. All right, so he's, look what it's saying here, saying this Nicolas de Ovando, most likely more, or black conquistador, brought with him from Spain a number of Iberian-born black slaves. All right, Iberian, that's all Spain and Portugal, right? And 
and says that he brought him so he can help him subdue the indigenous population more on more black on black right they seem to have done the opposite however for within a few months Ovando had banned further introduction of blacks on the grounds that they incited native rebellion nevertheless in the ensuing decade king ferdinand repeatedly permitted and encouraged the taking across the atlantic of black slaves who continued to enter the colony in small but steadily growing numbers and participate in spanish expansion in the region right so this is starting to basically sound like they're saying that they brought they brought african slaves not to come work in plantations and to replace the indigenous uh, slave population but to actually subdue them and help them conquer and invade them that's what we've been reading so far right in 1508 ponce de leon took armed africans to help him conquer puerto rico all right again in 1508 ponce de leon took armed africans to help him conquer puerto rico all right so what's really going on who are these so-called slaves coming across the atlantic they're really slaves or really black militias mercenaries crusaders and while diego velasquez similarly used black auxiliaries or here's another word black auxiliaries in his conquest of cuba in 1511 15 uh, 12 so another account there right juan garrido later claimed to have participated in both these expeditions he joined in those invasions as well in 1515 velasquez wrote to the king that many black slaves were taken on the invasion of Cuba, but none were left there after its pacification due to the lack of royal authorization and because that would not convenient to your majesty. In their words, Velazquez probably had concerns over the loyalty of the slaves and saw more profit in their participation in further conquest. Think. So it says here the timeline for uh, Juan Garrido. Look at the very first thing it says. It says 1480 question mark and then it says born in West Africa and either sold as a slave to Portuguese traders or travels voluntarily to Portugal so which one is it that's two extremes all right so you know do the history do the research people and you'll see you'll get to the truth all right these people were not servants or slaves they came voluntarily to help enslave you Cortez was accompanied by a number of black auxiliaries Juan Garrido being the best known to us, but not necessarily to his Spanish contemporaries. Of the blacks who accompanied Cortes and other first generation conquerors in Mexico, we know the name of one, Francisco de Iguia, who may have soon died as he was alleged to have introduced smallpox to Mexico. Alright, so let's back up right there, alright? So we know millions of the native uh, peoples of America died because of the disease the Europeans were bringing. So one of these known Europeans, a black conquistador, more Francisco de Eguia, who, who may have soon died as he was alleged to have introduced smallpox to Mexico. Do the research on that. Another may have been a black slave of the conquerors named Juan Cortes. Another one, all right, right there. It is possible that Garrido is one of the servants of Cortes who appears to be black in the paintings accompanying the 16th century history by Dominican friar Diego Duran. And in similar illustration in the Codex Azcatitlán. And this is the Codex Azcatitlán, as you can see. There is a black uh, uh, knight, appears to be like a knight with Cortes. Right? And this is supposedly Juan Garrido. Or one, both of these servants may be Juan Cortes. So it either could be Juan Garrido or Juan Cortes, which are both, both black conquistadors. I suggest, however, that it is just as likely that these portraits represent the fact that in the words of Sahagun's Florentine Codex, among the Spaniards came some blacks who had crisply curled dark hair. Just as other figures in these paintings represent Spanish invaders, native auxiliaries, or native nobles, so do the black figures here represent the presence at these events of 
black auxiliary all right all these tags they put on so again from the jewish encyclopedia.com says here spain the plural of wish was taken as the common name for jews of spanish origin by richard godheel mayor kaiserling and joseph jacobs the moranos the history of the jews henceforth in spain is that of the moranos whose numbers as has been shown had been increased by no less than 50,000 during the period of expulsion. As Spain got possession of New World, the Moranos attempted to find a refuge from the Inquisition in both the East and the West Indies, where they often came in contact with relatives who had remained true to their faith or had become reconverted in Holland or elsewhere. These formed business alliances with their relatives remaining in Spain so that a large portion of the shipping and importing industry of that country fell into the hands of the Moranos and their Jewish relatives everywhere. So you see how they say that Jews financed most of the conquest and the Atlantic slavery, right? So this is kind of like the foundational truth about it is that because the Moranos and these Jews knew had relatives in the New World and Holland and all these other places, even after they got ex exposed from Spain and Portugal, they were able to keep business going with these different locations and these connections they were making so they had control of the you know the transatlantic basically market not just slaves but the whole market everything fruits vegetables everything the wealth thus acquired was often sequestrated into the coffers of the inquisition but this treatment led to the reprisals on part of the Moranos abroad and there can be no doubt that the decline of Spanish commerce in the 17th century was due in large measure to the activities of the Moranos of Holland, Italy, and England, who diverted trade from Spain to those countries. When Spain was at war with any of these countries, Jewish intermediation was utilized to obtain knowledge of Spanish naval activity. So you see, they still had power, even though they were being exposed to Spain and Portugal. So continuing in this article from the JewishEncyclopedia.com uh, regarding uh, well the history here in Spain and Portugal, the, uh, the Iberian Peninsula or Iberian Kingdom, this part of the Mediterranean, you know, and, and, and the northern kings of uh, northern Africa and their relation to the Moors and how it all, how there's a deep history here to understand too as well, you know. Um, but it says here the arrival of the Moors, with Tisa, the son of Egiha. Egihka is described sometimes as paragon of virtue and sometimes as a veritable theme. The latter description of him is the one generally given by ecclesiastical writers. Lucas de Toy, Archbishop Rodrigo, Ambrosio de Morales, Juando, Mariana, and other Spanish historians hold that this king, to further heretical ends, misused the previous decisions of the councils, that he recalled the exiled Jews, granted them privileges and even entrusted them with public offices. Whether this be true or whether, as is more probable, he oppressed them as his predecessors had done, it remains a fact that the Jews, either directly or through their correligionists in Africa, encouraged the Mohammedans to conquer Spain and that they greeted them as their deliverers. Alright, so you're hearing this? So they're kind of saying that the Jews, at this point in time, it says here in 711 helped the Mohammedans take over Spain and they were that's how the Jews were able to come back because they had been exposed They've, the history here in Spain and Portugal the Jews have been exposed a lot right and these so-called Jews right we're gonna see who they are as well in after the battle of Jerez 711 in which African Jews fought bravely under Kaula al Jahudi so Jews fighting under Muslims, right? In which the last Gothic king, Rodrigo, and his nobles were slain, the Gothic king. The conqueror Musa and Tariq were everywhere victorious. The conquered cities Cordoba, Malaga, Granada, Seville, and Toledo were placed in charge of the Jewish inhabitants who had been armed by the Arabs. All right, there's a coalition going on here, confederacy. The victors removed the disabilities which had oppressed the Jews so heavily and granted them full religious liberty, requiring them to pay only the tribute of one golden dinar per capita. 
find that in the Historia de los Judíos in España, page 33. Continuing, a new error now dawned for the Jews of the Pyrenean Peninsula, whose number had been considerably augmented by those who had followed the Arab conquerors, as well as by later immigrants from Africa. Okay. Hardly a decade after the conquest, however, many Jews left their new home in order to follow a man named Serenus, Sonora Sonaria, who had appeared in Syria and had proclaimed himself the Messiah. This was in 721, according to their chronology. The governor Ambasa Ambisa, who was collecting enormous sums for the fiscus, confiscated the property of the immigrating Jews for this purpose. Under the Omiyat Ab al-Rahman, first, whose greatness is said to have been foretold by a learned Jew who became his advisor, a flourishing kingdom was established, of which Cordoba was the center. That sounds almost like the story of Josephus and Titus, how Josephus prophesied that Titus would be king, or the Roman, right, will be, will be the emperor. And then he became his loyal friend after he did, just like this guy. It says, during Ab el Rahman's reign, the Jews devoted themselves to the service of the Caliphate. All right, so the Jews were serving who? The Muslims, right? To the study of the sciences and to commerce and industry, especially to trading in silk and slaves. In this way, promoting the prosperity of the country. So these Jews, right? These were Talmudic Jews. Right, they practice the Kabbalah and all those teachings coming out of the Hellen Hellenistic times of Greek, mixing our ancient paleo science uh, that was in America, Atlantis slash Atlantis, and hijacking it Doth, you know, through Doth and his uh, teachings in uh, the so-called old world, the Egyptian and Babylonian uh, sciences and mysteries. It says here they were in the service of the Caliphate to study of the sciences, all right, and in trading slaves right from early times under Ab al Rahman the first and al Hakim the reigns of al Ab al Rahman the first called al Nasir 912 to 961 and his son al Hakim were the golden era of the Spanish Jews and Jewish science Ab Rahman's court physician and minister was Hazdai ben Isaac Ibn Shaprut so you see how these names have like Muslim and Hebrew um, so you see how these uh, names have like Muslim and Hebrew influence and you know it makes sense you know they both uh, say they go back to Abraham right so it says the patron of Menahem ben Saru Dunash ben Labrat and other Jewish scholars and poets during his term of power, the scholar Moses ben Enoch was appointed rabbi of Cordoba, and as a consequence, Spain became the center of Talmudic study. Boom, Talmudic. All right. So again, the center of Talmudic study in Cordoba, the meeting place of Jewish savants. After the downfall of Al Hakim, who likewise favored the Jews, a struggle for the throne broke out between. Sulaiman ibn al-Hakim and Muhammad ibn Hisham. Sulaiman solicited the assistance of Count Sancho of Castile, while Muhammad, through the agency of wealthy Jewish merchants in Cordoba, obtained the aid of Count Ramon of Barcelona. For this, Sulaiman took fearful revenge upon the Jews, expelling them mercilessly from city and country. 1013. With the overthrow of Banu Amir, the power of the Mohammedan state in Spain came to an end. The mighty caliphate of Cordoba being divided into 12 minor states under the different caliphs. The Abadites ruled in Seville, the Hamudites in Malaga, the Sairites in Granada, the Benuhut in Saragossa, and others in Almeria, Toledo, Valencia, Niebla, etc. Several Jews left Cordoba for Malaga, Granada, Toledo, Murcia and Zaragoza. So you see how this was under Muslim rule for hundreds of years. All right, so I just wanted to give a little background of, uh, you know, the history or a little bit of the history before, uh, you know, these Europeans, these uh, so-called conquistadors or exp so-called explorers were coming over to the Americas, the so-called New World, which was the real old world. Uh, so you can see, 
you know, the kind of people, the influence that it has, and these people that were coming over here, their history, their ancestry. All right, so we just want to go back to this book, uh, Christopher Columbus and the Participation of the Jews. And it says here he was talking about when he landed uh, on the land called, or the island, Guanahani, which was the Bahamas. It says here, Columbus took possession of this island for the ruler of Castile and then sailing southwest to Fernandina, discovered the island which he named Isabella in honor of the queen. Still searching for the island of Sipango with its fabulous wealth of gold and spices. Again, he was looking for Sipango, right? You heard that earlier. He, re he reached Cuba by the end of October. He believed that he was in the immediate neighborhood of the great Khan's kingdom. All right, so Columbus, you know, as his mission was to him was basically to go find the mysterious and legendary Prester John, right? That everybody's been searching for for 500 years, supposedly, all right, in medieval, since medieval times. And so he determined that he was there in the neighborhood of the Great Khans, right? The Grand Khan, Great Canyon, Grand Canyon, right? It says, and he determined to send envoys into the interior to a certain, as he expressed it in a letter to Luis de Santangel, where the king or, or great cities were there. This mission he entrusted to Luis de Torres, who was accompanied by Rodrigo de Jerez of Ayamonte. So as we remember, we read earlier that Luis de Santangel was one of the uh, first persons that believed or believed in supposedly in Columbus, helped him get financed and a connection to the queen so the voyage was made possible with his efforts to help columbus so uh there's a letter columbus wrote to him saying he was looking for he was going to go look and find the great khan the grand khan juan khan prester uh, john or juan 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 which is aka king david in reality because we know cusco was the real place where ancient Jerusalem was next to the city of David or Saksawaman, the citadel, the fortress. It says Columbus gave them specific instructions. So this is again, he sent two envoys, right? Luis de Torres, right? Remember who he was? The interpreter that knew Hebrew. His official interpreter, he sent out to go look for the Grand Khan in Cuba to the interior of the island, him and Jerez of Ayamonte. So it says Columbus gave them specific instructions, ordered them to prepare the way for a treaty of peace between the ruler of the country and the Castilian crown, and gave them a letter and presents for the former. They also took with them samples of pepper and other spices in order to show them to the natives and ascertain where such things grew. On Friday, November 2nd, Luis de Torres and his companion began their journey into the unknown land and returned to Columbus on the 6th. They reported that after traveling 60 miles, they came to a place with 50 huts and with a population of about 1,000 persons. Here they found men and women with fire in their hands, with which they lit one end of a small rod held in the mouth. It resembled dry leaves and was called tobacco. In Cuba, Española, and the other islands which he discovered, Columbus found natives who had their caciques and their own language and traditions. To what race did these aborigines of America belong? Several writers have asserted to have displayed much learning in attempting to prove that the aborigines were descendants of the Jews. Okay, so, alright, so we've been taking this journey, you know, if you've seen the uh, Hebrew Cup of Colored of Originals uh, video. Uh, that I made uh, and relating to all the accounts that have uh, basically come from the past uh, of these early settlers, colonists, pilgrims, um, believing and writing in their accounts that they have found the lost tribes in America, you know, and uh, if we know that this is the old world, then they actually found the old world so they found the tribe that originally were in the old world right or what they have put in the bible in the old testament and so-called bible lands all right so as you can see columbus 
and was also trying to understand this. That's why he brought a Hebrew interpreter with him, Luis de Torres, so he can speak Hebrew, not the Jewish Jewish of today, a Syrian uh, mixture, but Paleo Hebrew, which was vibrational, Aboriginal to the Americas. That's why they found uh, in New Mexico those lunar stones, which is written Paleo Hebrew. They gave it a date of at least 500 to 2,000 years ago. I'll study that. So let's continue. It says, This result was reached already in the 16th century by the Spanish clergyman Roldan. His arguments were derived from an unpublished manuscript which he discovered in the library of Sao San Pablo in Seville. Montesinos, who possessed the manuscript of Luis Lopez, the learned bishop of Quito, that's in Ecuador, was convinced that the Peruvians were of Jewish origin. The Peruvians, and where do we say the city of David was? I just told you, Cusco, Peru. Where is the oldest pyramid in the world? In Peru, Caral Sucre, and there's many others in South America. And where's the oldest mummies found? Chile, Peru. All right, so where are the real cradles of civilization? So again, the Bishop of Quito was convinced that Peruvians were of Jewish origin. The view of Roldan and Gregorio Garcia that the Aborigines of America were descendants of the Jews was maintained with many arguments in one and the same year, 1650, independently by the Englishman Thorogood and by the Portuguese Jew Manasseh and Israel. A renowned rabbi of Amsterdam who induced Cromwell to allow the Jews to return to England. A Portuguese Marano, here we go again, another Marano of Villa Flor, who, strange to say, also called himself Montesinos and afterwards assumed the name Aaron Levi, informed Manasseh that he had mingled in South America with Jews of the Ten Tribes. Manasseh's book attracted much attention and was translated into Latin, Spanish, Dutch, English, Italian, and Hebrew. And we read a little bit of this book in the other videos uh, that I made. And so we're also going to go back into it in, in future videos. All right. So it says, nor has interest in it ceased even at the present day. One more interest then the mode of migration is the question whether any analogies in language, in traditions, in religious conceptions, or in religious ceremonies justify the accept acceptance of this ethnological theory. Roldan's chief argument in support of his view is the language of the Indians in Hispaniola, Cuba, Jamaica, and the adjoining islands. He contends that it has many resemblances to Hebrew. Again, Roldan's chief argument in support of his view in the language of the Indians in Española, Cuba, Jamaica, and the adjoining islands, he contends that it was many, has many resemblances to Hebrew. In fact, he even calls it a corrupted Hebrew. Yes, because he doesn't know, understand the ancient Paleo, Picto, symbol uh, Hebrew, vibrational, right? It's not about words or religion. So, uh, for example, let's take a look at the word Hebrew, right? It's etymology. All right, I don't know if you saw my other videos talking about Eber, right? So it says here in etymology uh, dictionary for the word Hebrew, it says late Old English from Old French Hebrew, 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 from Latin Hebrews, from Greek Hebraeus, from Aramaic Semitic Hebrae, Hebra, Hebra, Hebra. You see that Hebra. Corresponding to Hebrew, Ebri, an Israelite, traditionally from an ancestral name Eber. From an ancestral name Eber. So that's one of the sons of, uh, on the line of Shem. But probably, literally, one from the other side. So really, Hebrew is basically saying, meaning he is from one from the other side. Perhaps in reference to the river Euphrates, or perhaps simply signifying immigrant from Eber, region on the other or opposite side. So, are you living in the region on the other region or the opposite side from a European's perspective? 
Is that where America is on the opposite side of Europe and Africa? Yes, right? So one from the other side, Hebrew, Hebrew, Israeli, so all the different meanings, but really it goes down to basically being one from the other side. So Eber, again, the region beyond, the region beyond. If you remember Ebra, which means in, uh, which means a pinion. So we remember again Ebra, right? Eber, Ebra, which means a pinion. And a pinion is basically a feather. Yes, a feather. Ebra, its root etymology or foundational uh, meaning is feather. Ebra. Who holds feathers to be important and sacred? Who dresses with feathers? It says here, word study feathers and wings. The word here for feathers is Ibra, which is often associated with the feathers of a dove. Although I have found it used to reference the feathers of an ostrich or eagle. So as it says here, it says Psalms 91.4. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. A little bit down for says, It is interesting that this word Ebra, or feathers, comes from the Semitic word Eber, Shemitic Semitic, Shem, which means the feathers of a dove. However, it is rooted in the Akkadian word Abaru, which is the word for being firm, fixed, strong immovable Jewish sages apply this word for the idea of covering for protection so using feathers as a covering for protection again it's opinion which is a feather and so Ebra we get Hebrew and we also get Abra Ibrahim Ebra Ibrahim we get Hebrew Eber or Ebra which is feathers Abraham, Abraham. So Abraham is related to feathers as well. So when they're talking about Abraham, who were they really talking about in the ancient Paleo Hebrew? Were they just talking about a priest king over here on this side, a chief, Kasike, Katsin, a Katsin, Katsinke? And continues regarding Roldan. He asserts that such names as Cuba and Haiti are Hebrew and that they were first applied by the earliest caciques, the chiefs or leaders, Kassim. Alright, we're going to see what he means by that, Kassim, who discovered and peopled the islands. The names of rivers and persons, islands, the names of rivers and of persons in use among the natives are derived from the Hebrew, for example, Haina. From the Hebrew, Ain, stream, Jones from Jonah, Jake from Jacob, Ures from Urias, Siabao from Siba, Maisi from Moisi, the names of their tools, of their little canoes or Kansas, the name Akshi for pepper, the name of the storehouse for maize, grain, and the like, all point to the Hebrew language. Alright? Their rites and ceremonies as well as their language, form one of the main arguments in favor of this theory of descent. Circumcision prevailed among the Indians. They often bathed in rivers and streams. They refrained from touching the dead and from tasting blood. They had definite fast days. Marriage with sister-in-law was permitted if they were childless widows. Wives were discarded for new helpmates. They also sacrificed first fruits on high mountains and under shady trees. They had temples and carried a holy ark before them in time of war. Okay, so they had temples and carried a holy ark before them in time of war. They were also like the ten tribes, including to idol worship. And according to him, idol worship, what he's thought of the ten tribes. All writers and travelers agree, moreover, that there were many Jewish types of faiths among the Indian, the aborigines of America. So again, just want to bring you back to the word that he mentioned as katsin or katsike. He was saying katsike comes from katsin. What is katsin? 
so just in case you you miss me dropping this on 432thedropradio.com you know as it says here Kasike 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 Katsing Chief Arawakan Hawakan dropped by Kuri Mayo so you can check I have a little personal channel here so I invite you to Drop Nation tune in every Monday I have a radio show there as well uh, check out the schedule a great platform you know static free you know brought to us by the great Khan Drop there you go. I wanted to see if, uh, how do you say chief in Hebrew? And I was able to find this, which is katsin, right? And you can see the phonetic spelling katsin, katsin, with a K, katsin. In the West Indies and Spanish countries, the chiefs are called kasike, katsin, katsi, ke, katsin ki, katsike, katsin. Very similar. Again, it says he asserts that such names of Cuba and Haiti are Hebrew and that they were first applied by the earliest caciques, Katsi, the chiefs or leaders, Katsin. Katsin, again, is Hebrew. Again, Katsin means chief or ruler. Same thing as in Arawak language, Taino language, right? Katsike, because Katsike is a Taino or Arawak word. So what are the Arawak really speaking, which who came from South America, right? We're telling you that the ancient Jerusalem was over there in South America, in Peru. The Arawak came from South America before they landed in the West Indies. And their word for chief ruler is the same as Hebrew, Katsink, Katsinke, Katsin. It's the same. So why did Columbus bring in a Hebrew interpreter? Well, he knew why. Again, he wrote he was coming to conquer or take over uh, the holy city in Mount Sinai for the king and queen of Spain. Now I'm going to talk to you about uh, Matthew da Costa. And I got this picture from the uh, Canada Post Office official website, the Canadian Post Office. And I guess this is a stamp they uh, did about him to commemorate uh, this person, I guess, their in their history. So in their page it says, in honor of Black History Month and pay tribute to Canada's rich tradition of diversity with this booklet of 10 permanent domestic stamps. The stamps feature an image of Matthew da Costa, an explorer and interpreter from West Africa who is believed by some to be the first named person of African descent to reach Canada. So just to stop right there real quick, it's interest, it would be interesting to know where they get the information that he's African because have they done their research to really know, to really say that he's from West Africa because we're going to read a different version later on. In continuance, as a skilled linguist who was proficient in several languages, the Costa accompanied multiple European expeditions to the New World where he earned a living by facilitating deals between fur traders and indigenous people. All right. That's signed by Andrew Perro and illustrated by Ron Dolkamp. The stamp depicts the Costa in the foreground, dressed in period clothing. In the harbor behind him, several canoes carrying aboriginal people paddled toward a sailing ship. So again, just to emphasize, he was a famous interpreter. He did a lot of deals between uh, the Indians and the Europeans. He was able to facilitate the deals, you know, like the middleman. So is this guy like another Murano or more? Did he speak Hebrew? Why is it so easy for these so-called black conquistadors or explorers to communicate with the natives of America? Why were they the ones being used as interpreters everywhere? All right, so think about that. So this is uh, Matthew da Costa, the Black Moor, Ladino Moor, who discovered Canada. This is Matthew da Costa, the Ladino Moor, who discovered Canada, by Oge Hiofo Anu. Matthew da Costa was a Black Ladino Moorish Jew of Iberian origins. So look at all the titles we how we just related before. So he was a Black Ladino Moorish Jew of Iberian origins see it's all the same people he was portuguese more and his family had lived in portugal for at least 600 years as the lords 
of the land before they were brutally conquered and expelled from Portugal by the barbaric hordes of Reconquista Gothic Crusaders under the banner of the Papacy of Vatican. So, clearly telling you that the Moors had control of all those uh, places as we just read before in Spain and Portugal and all that area of Europe, Mediterranean. For almost 600 years he says his family was there until it was invaded by the barbaric white tribes. Yes, white tribes. The Moors of Portugal were expelled by 1497 with the Edicts of Expulsion and the Lease de Limpieza de Sangue, the Laws of Cleanness of Blood. The Laws of Cleanness of Blood stated that all Moors and Jews had to flee the peninsula. All Moors and Jews, alright? Not separated together. Moors and Jews. And that any Gothic Cretan crusader who aspired to have a middle to high ranking office in the kingdoms had to prove that he had no Moorish or Jewish ancestry for at least five generations until the fourth or fifth generation. All right. The laws lasted until the end of the 18th century. The Costas family was a sea trading family probably descended from the Moorish Venetians. Right, so it's saying that he is probably descended from Moorish Venetians of the ancient times, otherwise variously called the Carthaginians or the Canaanites or the Moors. So it's all the same people, ancient Canaanites, right? Who are the ancient Canaanites? Well, we know that in the Torah or Old Testament, they are the uh, one of the enemies of the Israelites from Shem and the Canaanites are from Ham even though they're distant cousins they're tr different tribes different peoples All right so it says here that the, the coast of descended from these Moorish Phoenicians Canaanites Carthaginians or the Moors his family named the Costa means of the sea that they were traditional seafarers his name the Costa also indicated that he was a blood Jewish Ladino, a Moorish Canaanite Jew, a Moorish, Moorish Canaanite Jew. Come on. And if we read Psalms 83, we see they made a confederate, right? You know, all these different uh, tribes and clans. And you can see it in the combination of this person right here, ancestry, which is Jewish Ladino, Moorish Canaanite Jew. Like Louis de Torres, another Moorish Jew who performed the role of interpreter for Christopher Columbus on his first American voyage. There we go again. All right. A Canaanite Jew. Louis de Torres was also a Moorish Jew. Canaanite Jew. These are the same people, you see. As was his family tradition. Matthew the Costa grew up into an able seaman, a marine time trader, and a global adventurer. Seafarers played a crucial role in the relief of the imperiled Moors, subjected to genocidal criminality by the gang of Gothic Reconquistadas. Upon their interdiction in the Iberia by the Bull of Toledo, gangs of Moorish seamen organized to rescue hundreds of thousands of fleeing Moors. For instance, it is recalled that Moorish Portuguese sailor Sequeira had sailed to area now known as Lagos in 1472 with a ship load of Moorish refugees. Others like the Moorish seafaring families like the Ninos and the Pinso Pinsos of Spain, example Pierto the Nino who brought Columbus to the Americas and we've already covered him, right? Estevanico also known as Stephen the Moor, there we go again, Stavanico, the explorer of what is now the southwest of the United States of America, and Matthew da Costa, who brought Champlain to Canada, were at hand to ferry the Moorish refugees from southern Europe to the continents of Africa and the Americas, to more friendly shores wherein they could start anew. So you see, this story developing, right? You see how all these people were coming here with the so-called times of discovery or exploration. And they were coming to take your land, helping invade you, signing treaties, and then becoming the aboriginals? Is that what, I mean, that's what basically 
I'm seeing. All right, so according to William Smith, Dictionary of Greek and Roman Geography, 1866, the Canaanites were these Moors who must not be considered as different race from the Numidians, but as a tribe belonging to the same stock, were re represented by Salust. Sal Judges 21 as, as a remnant of the army of Hercules and by Propocius as the posterity of the Canaanians who fled from robber Joshua. He quotes two columns with a Phoenician inscription. So let's go back right here. So I just want to mention what he just said. So it says that these are Moors, right? They're remnants or of the race of the Numidians. Uh, belonging to a stock, a remnant of the army of Hercules. And, you know, we they know that Hercules, you know, all these ancient gods, you know, a, a lot of that is stolen from the legacy left by Atlantis, all the Atlantean gods. So it's all the same people, these people coming from Canaan, right? They say Ham and Cush is the first one to inhabit Africa, and he came from Canaan. And Canaan seems to be in, in the old road which seems to be the true whole world, right? Where we've been learning in America. So it says that as the posterity of the Canaanians or Canaanites, right? Who fled from Robert Joshua. So they're saying, they're recalling the history of what happened to them when Jehoshua uh, and in other circles called Kitzakot, right? The one who delivered the Hebrews to Jerusalem invaded and sacked a lot of the Canaanite uh settlements and towns because that was promised to the descendants of Shem all right it's the so-called promised land right this was all in America we're talking about Peru he went into Jerusalem and Peru we're not talking about Jesus we're not talking about the New Testament we're talking about the Old Testament Jehoshua the predecessor to Moses or Moshe Kuku Khan so in their view in the Moors view they see Joshua as a robber <laughs> because that is their enemy, right? The Israelites, Jehoshua. But who did Columbus bring as a you know to speak to the natives? He brought a Hebrew interpreter. We have numerous accounts of the lost tribes being found, numerous correlation to relate um, Hebrew culture or influence, if you want to call it Hebrew to the, uh, na a lot of the Native American tribes. Procopius has been supposed to be the only or at least the most ancient author who mentions in this inscription and the invention of it has been attributed to himself. It occurs however in the history of Moses of Chorin who wrote more than a century before Procopius. The same inscription is mentioned by Suidas who probably quotes from Procopius. So all these people are stating the same thing. Most of the Arabian writers adopted a nearly similar tradition to wit that the indigenous inhabitants of North Africa were the people of Palestine, Canaanites, expelled by David, who returned to Africa under the guidance of Goliath, whom they call the Jalaut. All right, so here we go. Like we, like I've been, like I said before. You know, one thing is history; another thing is religion. You know, we've been taught certain things as religion. Uh, almost like a fairy tale, like a story, like it's something way in the past, BC times, but our chronology is all messed up. So, if you know the story of David and Goliath, right? How he slayed uh, the giant Goliath. So, it says here again, it says <laughs> that the indigenous inhabitants of North Africa were the people of Palestine, Canaanites expelled by David, who returned to Africa under the guidance of Goliath. So that's the giant he had uh, beef with, right? He threw the stone and he defeated. So it says that he followed a people to North Africa, or he guided the people to North Africa, this Goliath. These were Canaanites, right? And they were in ancient Palestine. And we're talking about the real ancient Palestine. We're not talking about that fake one they created on the other side, where they call uh, Palestine today, right? So. As you can see, a lot of stories we've been seeing in past videos, how it seems that there's more probabilities of Americans traveling or crossing the Atlantic from um, this this side over to Africa and West Europe uh, first, and civilizing and bringing, you know, 
civilization, agriculture, science, religions, Freemasonry, you know, all that. Again, King David, aka, we're gonna see Prester John. King David, aka the Grand Khan. King David over here in Jerusalem, the ancient real Jerusalem in Cusco, Peru. All right, you gotta start matching things. So, with that uh, said and continuing, I wanted to talk to you about the Moabite stone. If you never heard about it, so it says here the skeptics claim that King David never existed. It's now hard to defend. Last year, the French scholar Andre Lemari reported a related House of David discovery and biblical archaeology review. His subject was the Mesha steel also known as the Moabite stone, the most extensive inscription ever recovered from ancient Palestine, found in 1868 at the ruins of biblical Dibon and later fractured. The basalt stone wound up in the Louvre, where Lemari spent seven years studying it. His conclusion, the phrase House of David appears there as well. As with the Taldan fragment, this inscription comes from an enemy of Israel, boasting of a victory, King Mesha of Moab, who figured in the Bible. Lemari had to reconstruct a missing letter to decode the wording, but if he's right, there are now two 9th century references to David's dynasty. And this was from Time Magazine, December 18, 1995, volume 146, number 20. Five again, so and this stone is about an enemy of Israel, right? Again, boasting of a victory. So they just defeated the Israelites, these Moabs. So, what is this ancient Moab kingdom or, or these Moabites? All right, so surf the wave a little bit with me again. Let's see this as history, not religion. So, it says here in the Encyclopedia Britannica website, it says Moabite. Member of a West Semitic people who lived in the highlands east of the Dead Sea, now in West Central Jordan, flourished in the 9th century BC. They are known principally through the information given in the Old Testament and from the inscription on the Moabite stone, which we just talked about, the Moabite stone. The Moabites culture is dated by scholars from about the late 14th century BC to 582 BC, dodged the hijack, when according to the Jewish historian Josephus, first century AD they were conquered by the Babylonians so even Josephus talks about these Moabites in Old Testament accounts Genesis 1930 to 38 the Moabites belong to the same ethnic stock as the Israelites same ethnic stock as the Israelites so their family distant cousins their ancestral founder was Moab a son of Lot who was a nephew of the Israelite patriarch Abraham here we go again, Abra, hey bra, bra, feathers up, right, feather, Eber, Ebra. Moab had become a tributary of Assyria by the late 8th century BC and was conquered by the Babylonians in 582 BC. So the Assyrians also conquered the Moabites and we know that the Assyrians also um, enslaved, you know, and held captive the Israelites as well, All right? Their territory was resettled by the Nabataeans in the 4th and 3rd century BC. So right here is going to say that, that the Moabites disappeared from history. But we're going to learn from Noble Drew Ali, the prophet of the Moors, who the Moabites were and who they are today. It says here the Moabite language differed only dialectally from Hebrew. And Moabite religion and culture were very closely related to those of the Israelites. Nevertheless, Moabites were excluded from the Jewish community, Deuteronomy 23, 3-6, where the name Moab became a typical denomination for the enemies of God, Isaiah 25, 10. So you see these Moab uh, tribes or these people from this family that became tribes, something happened in their history where they separated from these other so-called tribes that were so-called Israelites, right, or Hebrews or those that live uh, on the opposite side, right? Or with the feathers. So basically, they, they're kind of telling us that they're distant cousins. They were related at some point. So, 
now we can see why there was Jews in Spain and why these Moors or Maranos, right? They were all the same. They spoke Hebrew because they were ancient Canaanites. Canaanites spoke, again it says here, that the Moabite language differed only dialectally from Hebrew. And Moabite religion and culture were very closely related to those of the Israelites. So all these interpreters, these Maranos, these Moors that were coming over here, can speak to the Indians because they knew the ancient Hebrew or was similar to what they were speaking even though it might not have been the same because they had changed they had migrated out of Canaan right flash America <laughs> South America North America so why did I uh, bring up the Moabites right so and what is their relation to the Moors now I want to uh, basically show you the history they they teach each other uh, even even from one of their founders which is Noble Drew Ali so who who is Noble Drew Ali let's just uh, read a little bit about him so it's here no, Noble Drew Ali it says Timothy Drew better known as Noble Drew Ali January 8 1886 till J July 20 1929 was a Moorish American leader who founded the Moorish Science Temple of America the Moorish Science Temple of America is an established nation state since 1928. An established nation state. Considered a prophet by his followers, he founded the first American Islamic organization in 1913 in Newark, New Jersey, before relocating to Chicago, where he gained a following of thousands of converts. So I just want to show you uh, regarding what we've been learning and talking about, right? What Noble Drew Ali has to say about all this history, right? It's more of more history. So it says here, Noble Drew Ali explains two portions of history in the Holy Quran of the Moorish Science Temple of America. Chapter 45 and 48. The Prophet informs us that the inhabitants of Africa are the descendants of the ancient Canaanites. From the land of Canaan, Old Man Kush and his family are the first inhabitants of Africa who came from the land of Canaan. Again, so Noble Drew Ali is telling us that the first inhabitants of Africa are descendants of ancient Canaanites. Okay, remember the Canaanites, right? We've been talking about them. From the land of Canaan. It says Old Man Kush, and Cush is one of Ham's sons in the story of the Bible and his family are the first inhabitants of Africa who came from the land of Canaan right Canaan in America his father Ham and his family were second then came Ham and the rest of them then came the word Ethiopia which means the demarcation line of the dominion of Amexem the first true and divine name of Africa so you can see that Ethiopia you know, didn't mean a certain place, but it was in, in according to more science temple teachings, the demarcation line of the meaning of Amexem. So I guess from, because they used to consider America Amexem or Africa, Northwest and Southwest Africa, they used to call America and Northeast and Southeast was the other side of Amexem. And in between, that would be the Ethiopia demarcation line, as they are saying here. First true divine name of Africa. The dividing of the land between the father and the son. I'm talking about Ham and Cush. The dominions of Cush, Northeast and Southeast Africa. And Northwest and Southwest was his father's dominion of Africa. And they're talking about the Americas. In later years, many of their brethren from Asia and the Holy Land joined them. Their brethren from the Asia and the Holy Land. The Moabites from the land of Moab who received permission from the pharaohs of Egypt to settle and inhabit Northwest Africa. So it says that they had to receive permission from pharaohs of Northwest Africa. Again, remember, Northwest Africa to them was North America. So they had to receive permission from the pharaohs. So they're saying that the pharaoh held it down there in North America. So we remember we've been talking about the old world uh, is America and ancient Egypt was in America so they had to get permission from the pharaohs of Egypt to settle and inhabit Northwest Africa they were the founders and are the true possessors of the present Moroccan Empire all right so, so these Moabites right 
are the founders of the Moroccan Empire. Don't the Moors come from the, or represent the Moroccan Empire? With their Canaanite, Hittite, and Amorite brethren who sojourned from the land of Canaan seeking new homes. So they were kicked out of Canaan, right? So we read earlier that the robber, Joshua, they called him the robber because he kicked out the Canaanite Moorish Phoenicians out of the Holy Land. Right, so we know that that's in Peru, Cusco, America. So that was ancient Canaan. That was the Holy Land. And that's where they got kicked out of. So again, it says, With their Canaanite and Hittite and Amorite brethren who sojourned from the land of Canaan, seeking new homes because they were kicked out of there. Their dominion and inhabitation extended from northeast and southwest Africa across Great Atlantis, America, right? Even unto the present North, South, and Central America, and also Mexico and the Atlantis Islands. As, as I've been saying, they've been talking about America this whole time. Before the great earthquake, which caused the great Atlantic Ocean. So before the deluge, the river now was dredged and made by the ancient pharaohs of Egypt in order to trade with surrounding kingdoms. Okay, so now let's back up here. He just said that the river Nile was dredged and made by the ancient pharaohs in Egypt. So what does he mean by that? And uh, we know that the Mississippi was definitely not dredged. So is he talking about the one in the other side? And what does dredged mean? Dredging, it says here, is an excavation activity usually carried out underwater in shallow seas or freshwater areas with the purpose of gathering up bottom sediments and widening. This technique is often used to keep waterways navigable and creates an anti-slush pathway for boats. It is also used as a way to replenish sand on some public beaches where sand has been lost because of coastal erosion. So basically they've created a river. They dredged it deeper, they made it wider, right, and made it navigable. That is what Drew Ali is saying, the ancient, ancient pharaohs did uh, with the now river so it's man-made so where is so where is the real now river ancient now river that wasn't dredged mississippi again the river now was dredged and made by the ancient pharaohs of egypt in order to trade with the surrounding kingdoms also the niger river was dredged by the great pharaoh of egypt in those ancient days for trade so that even that was dredged and it extends eastward from the river now westward across the great atlantic it was used for trade and transportation. According to all true and divine records of the human race, there is no Negro, black, or colored race attached to the human family because all the inhabitants of Africa were and are of the human race, descendants of the ancient Canaanite nation from the Holy Land of Canaan. So as uh, Drew Ali says, and the Moors know that you know there is no tags as negro black or colored you know you had tribal names of course he's gonna say that everybody from africa well that might be true our ancient canaanites well if so then you know there's different tribes than over here in america all right so continuing it says what your ancient forefathers were you are today without doubt or contradiction there's no one who is able to change man from the descendant nature of his forefathers unless his power extends beyond the great universal creator allah himself according to noble Drew Ali so if your forefathers were enemies of other tribes well, what does that mean then are they still enemies today are they still trying to confuse moorishamericannews.com from Moabite to more a short historical account says Islam much of the information of the time period region and people in question comes from written dialogue between Canaanite rulers and Amenhotep III and Akhenaten, called the Armarna Letters. Among other things, the letters mention Canaanite rulers having issues with the Habiru, commonly known as the Hebrews, all right, or those that live on the opposite side, the land beyond, Hebrews, Hebrew, Hebra, feathers, a term at that time that denoted class, as in displaced persons, not tribe nation status so you see what it just said so hebrews didn't mean in that time uh like he's saying a tribe or nation it was just a, a word to describe a denoted class 
like we were trying to say Hebrew has other meanings, right? The etymologies. But they clearly have in these letters that the Canaanite rulers had issues with the Habiru, which are turned out to be Hebrews, right? So this is history, not religion. What should be noted is that the region called at the time the land of Canaan was populated by city-states, each independent of the other and ruled by a single king, ruler. Again, the land of Canaan was populated by city states. Now, remember I told you that um, Canaan, you know, or ancient Jerusalem, right? Because that was in Canaan. That's where uh, Jerusalem was located, in the land of Canaan, was in Cusco, Peru. Now, it says here, Kingdom of Cusco, under the leadership of Manco Capac, the Inca formed small city state Kingdom of Cusco. Again, city-state. In 1438, they began a far-reaching expansion under the command of Sapa Inca, a paramount leader. Pachacuti Cusi Yupanqui, whose name literally meant Earth Shaker. The name of Pachacuti was given to him after he conquered the tribe of Chancas, modern Apurimac. Could that be the Canaanites? During his reign, he and his son Tupac Yupanqui brought much of the Andes Mountains roughly modern Peru and Ecuador under the Inca control all right so again city-state Cusco was the city-state the ancient Can uh, land of Canaan was populated by city-states so it is correlated all right so continuing so to occupy the land one would have to conquer each city-state the letters speak of campaign of conquest of the region by a military leader of these people named Joshua again the leader Joshua, a.k.a. Quetzalcoatl, a.k.a. Jehoshua, the real Jehoshua that led the people to ancient Jerusalem, the promised land, with the sword, not in a donkey. And continuing, it says, and speak of his occupation of Canaan, 1456 B.C., dodged the hijack with the chronology, as a matter of past events. This is natural since the letters are dated after the death of Joshua, consequently changing the complexion of the conquest efforts. Again, Jehoshua. Our focus relative to the issue at hand is the people that occupied that region that were driven out as a result of, of the Jehoshua campaign. So again, these Canaanites, these ancient Moors, right, were driven out of the land of Canaan in America, in Cusco. The Saqqara tomb or of Horemheb, 1334 BC, displays a, a relic showing Canaanite refugees attempting to enter Egypt. The relief also indicating that their lands and towns were destroyed. So where was this ancient Egypt they were entering? Was that in, I guess, North America or other parts, Atlantis or even the, the other uh, proxy Egypt on the other side? Archaeology supports 56% of the cities listed in the Bible that were conquered by Jehoshua. Yet it does not support the existence of Moab during that time, saying that the names of Moabite, Edomite, and Ammonite kings had parts of the names of their national gods embedded within it, and that none of these names have been found by them before 1100 BC. Because maybe they're looking at the wrong side, and that's what we've been saying this whole time. Of course, they ain't going to find it over there. While the Bible does not give the names of any of the kings of these three nations during the period of the Exodus, it does give a list of Edomite kings pre-national hood Israel, Genesis 36, 31-39, and some of these kings were associated with cities, while others are associated with a tribal people or region. None were recorded as being succeeded by his son. This is evidence to the fact that these nations remained semi-nomadic and tribal with the death of the strongest chief king meaning the end of the prominence of that said tribe as a matter of history Edomites and Midianites occupied Moab lands and had conflicts the head chief of one tribe gaining influence over the other on the same land caused recorded history to lean in the favor of the nationality of the reigning chief sometimes the losers moved away sometimes they fought lost and became absorbed and sometimes they prevailed. This demonstrates that the fact that the archaeologists not finding evidence of settled Moabite presence does not prove they did not exist. Alright again, 
they're the uh, modern day Moors, as Noble Drew Ali told us. And, you know, they're looking at the wrong side, right? When they're looking for all some of these cities of the ancient uh, Bible, you know, these Bible lands, they're looking at the wrong side, right? So this guy's trying to say, you know, it's not no proof, but we know, you know, there's, there's more to that. A late 13th century papyrus mentions Edomites and Moabites trying to enter Egypt because of a famine. This informs us that both Edom and Moab existed as a people before 1100 BC. Dodge the chronology hijack, right? Regardless of the lack of evidence, their own city state, at the very least, if it took 200 to 300 years of them to develop into a larger political community, this would push their origin back to 1400 to 1500 BC well within the time period of the Jehoshua campaign. Again, dodge that hijack, the chronology. And just to finish up, it says, the teaching of Prophet Drew Ali in the Moorish Science Temple of America on the subject reads thus, the industrious acts of the Muslims of Northwest and Southwest Africa, that was America, right? These are the Moabites, Hamatites, Canaanites, who were driven out of the land of Canaan by Jehoshua and received permission from the pharaohs of Egypt to settle in that portion of Egypt. In later years, they formed themselves kingdoms. These kingdoms are called, this day, Morocco, Algiers, Tunis, Tripoli, etc. And I'm going to end the video right here. I think we've covered a lot and I hope you understand what I'm trying to show and, and say and present. And I want to finish up with this uh, verse here. It says, Deuteronomy 23. 3, 6. And it says, No Ammonite or Moabite, remember Moabites or Moors, or any of their descendants may enter the assembly of Hawa, not even in the tenth generation. For they did not come to meet you with bread and water on your way when you came out of Egypt. And they hired Balaam, son of Beor from Petor, and Aram Naharaim to pronounce a curse on you. So they hired Balaam to put a curse on you. See this word Balaam, you're gonna see this word in Maya language, Balaam. And continues says, however, Hawa, your God would not listen to Balaam, but turn the curse into a blessing for you because Hawa, your creator, loves you. Do not seek a treaty of friendship with them as long as you live. Again, do not seek a treaty of friendship with them as long as you live. And he's talking about the Ammonites and Moabites. 